Hi everyone, uh, this is just a general introduction to topic five, which is looking at the economic dimensions of conflict. Um, so with this topic, we're moving into the second part of the unit where we're focusing on understanding the causes of contemporary conflict. In this topic, we look at the economic drivers of, of contemporary conflict. Then in topic six, we move on to look at questions around how ethnicity or ethnic identity can serve as a driver of conflict. One sort of word of warning on this topic, we will be engaging with some economics literature, some studies that use econometrics, which is to say applying statistical methods to economic data. Don't let that put you off too much. The key thing is that you understand the approach that they're taking broadly um, and that you understand their arguments. So don't worry if you don't understand all the details of the various models and regressions and how they do that econometric analysis. Broadly in this topic, we're going to be looking at what's known in the academic literature as the greed versus grievance debate. So we're going to be scrutinizing both sides of that argument. We'll also look at some potential alternatives to the greed versus grievance perspectives. Um, we will then move on to examine some of the kind of wider policy implications that have stemmed from this debate and from the two different sides. And we'll be thinking through some of the consequences for that. So particularly in this topic, you can see here in this diagram at the center really is what we'll be focusing on in the topic, which is the theories, the greed related uh, theories and the more grievance related theories. But in order to do that, we'll be scrutinizing also the evidence and the methods that these theories draw on. We'll also be then kind of looking forward at what happens when these theories kind of hit the real world, if you like, and we'll be trying to understand actually what, what happens uh, to those theories when they're picked up by policymakers. Just a very brief background to this debate. So the debate starts up really in the sort of 1990s, like a lot of the things that we look at um, in this unit. You'll remember that I've mentioned previously that in the 1990s, we see particularly um, economists and other academics taking a growing interest in questions around the relationship between development and conflict and looking in more detail at the economic dimensions of conflict. Some of these studies are emerging in the context where the sort of dominant accounts of the conflicts that are emerging after the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s very much focus on the kind of ethnic drivers. So questions about, you know, primordial ethnic tensions um, being unleashed by the end of the Cold War that were captured in, in uh, books by Samuel Huntingdon and Robert Kaplan. And in some ways, what these theories, which focus more on the economic dimensions are doing, is trying to kind of rebalance that focus and to debunk some of these theories which are heavily focused on identity. I think when we're looking at questions around the economic dimensions of conflict, it's important to say that, in a sense, no one is really arguing that the economic dimensions of conflict are completely new. And some people do argue, um, like Mary Caldor, that these economic dimensions have become more important in the post-Cold War period but nobody denies that they've always been there. And in a sense, you know, the debate is not about whether or not there is some role for economic dimensions. The debate is really about how important are these factors? And in particular, are these sort of so-called greed related factors, which are to do with questions of, you know, rebel groups, for example, making an analysis of the costs and opportunities of taking up arms against the state. Are those kinds of factors more or less important than questions around identity and questions of people's sense that, you know, that there's a sense of injustice which is motivating them to take up arms. So broadly, the debate that we look at in this topic, it's been characterized in the academic literature as the greed versus grievance debate. I think that characterization is a bit of a simplification. It can be a bit misleading in some ways, but it's a useful sort of way to, to divide up um, various different perspectives as well. So what I'll do now is briefly sketch out the positions of the two most prominent figures who tend to act as kind of figureheads for both sides of this debate. On the greed side, the most prominent figure is Paul Collier, who's been very influential. He's a professor in e economics at Oxford University. The broad argument that Collier puts forward, which we'll look at in much more detail, is that basically it's poor countries, particularly those with low rates of economic growth, those that are reliant on primary commodities, those are the ones that are at greater risk of experiencing conflict. The theory that he develops involves this concept of a conflict trap. And basically the argument that he puts forward is because countries that are poorer are more at risk of going into conflict, what happens is you get a kind of vicious circle whereby once conflict is going on, that further undermines growth and development. 
and then puts them at subsequent greater risk of renewed conflict, um, even if they manage to come out of it. So it creates this kind of trap, which they find difficult to get out of. That's Collier's perspective, which is focusing very much on these kind of economic opportunities and incentives that will make it more likely for rebel groups to take up arms against the state. On the other side of the debate, the grievance side of the debate, the most prominent figure or one of the most prominent figures has been another now emeritus professor in development economics at the University of Oxford, Francis Stewart. Francis Stewart is more associated with this grievance side. It's important to recognize that her approach very much does incorporate an understanding of the economic dimensions, but it looks at how those interact with questions around social identity. Now, broadly, Stewart's argument is it's countries with sharp horizontal inequalities that are more likely to experience conflict. And just to kind of briefly explain what she means by horizontal inequalities, basically horizontal inequalities are inequalities between social groups. It doesn't just cover income and wealth, although that is one factor. It also covers inequalities in relation to political representation and also importantly, inequalities in relation to access to certain kinds of government mediated resources, for example, housing, education, government jobs. So she argues that it's in situations where you have inequalities in these kinds of resources that run along social lines, which could, um, for example, be along ethnic lines or it could be along religious lines. So, for instance, in Sri Lanka, there are inequalities, horizontal inequalities between the Sinhalese and Tamils. In Northern Ireland, there are horizontal inequalities between Protestants and Catholics. So broadly, Stuart's argument is that in order to understand which countries are likely to experience conflict, the key factor to look at is the horizontal inequalities, not simply, as Collier would argue, the question of whether or not this is a poor country with low rates of growth and that has got primary commodities.